Heavenly Father, thanks for the opportunity to be here. We love being with family. It's your family. Thank you. We pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts today. We're open. You're always kind. You're gentle. But we are asking for maybe some encouragement today or some correction, a challenge. We're open for whatever you have for us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, The passage is Galatians chapter 5, and we're in the one another's. There's 34 of them in the Bible. They're easy to pick out. There's a great book. Probably the classic book on the subject is by um, Getz. Uh, His first name is slipping my mind. It is an old one. 1970s it was written, and... It's on the one another's. It takes all of them and spends time explaining this is how a family works. This is how a crowd spends time together on one another's. There's 22 positive ones and there's 12 negative ones. And today we're on one of service. Some of them are mentioned more than once, like love one another is mentioned over and over. Service, I believe, is just mentioned the one time, and it's a boundary for us. So think of any group that you're a part of, and whether it's a family or a classroom, certainly us here today, this is an added piece that while we're together one another, that we serve one another. Martin Luther King was, of course, a Baptist preacher. 1968 is when he was killed. Listen to what he said. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need to have a full heart of grace, a soul generated by love. It's the encouragement for us, and we're asking today in openness to say, God, how do you want me to serve? In what ways would you like me to serve people around me? If you have your notes there in front of you, and we kind of clip through them a little bit, it's the first point is service, you may be surprised, is a very high priority. We just can't get it out of our mind. We think that leadership, being out front, being the one that takes the, uh, the arrows, that's, that's what's called. That's like the important stuff. But the service, we can be easily be replaced, or there's so many of us that it doesn't matter. It's not true. So in the book of Galatians, talking about grace, God's grace in our life, that it frees us. Think for a minute if you were literally incarcerated as we are in sin before Jesus frees us, we're incarcerated. Imagine if we're being let go and we're in a room, a holding room, we're saying you're about to walk out of that gate to be free. We're just about to. You've been bound to sin. You are inclined to sin. You are inclined to things of a selfishness about you. That's what you've bound to, to keep the law and you can't. But we're about to go. And with that in mind, it's Galatians 5. If you have a Bible, a handy, it's Galatians 5, and it's in verse 13 would be kind of the speech in that holding cell, for you were called to freedom, brothers. But as as you go, as you're leaving this room, it says only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You see that you're about to be free in Christ. You're able to be free and do through the power of the Spirit amazing things. You're no longer bound to sin. It's no longer the expectation to sin. You're free. But he says, but only, okay, before you go, but only don't use your freedom to fulfill the flesh. Instead, use your freedom to serve people. You actually now have the freedom to care and to serve people that are around you. 
we walk into any room, and whether it's here, a lobby, whether you walk into a store, we're like a radar, and we're in the center, and we're trying to figure out who's looking at us, what are they thinking of us. It's definitely that way at a party, that awkwardness of, I don't know who I'm talking to, and this, these insecurities. See, Jesus Christ has filled the insecurities so that we have the freedom to be vulnerable. Don't worry about yourself anymore. He's got you. You can walk into a room and instead be thinking about people around. Who needs encouraged? Who can I speak with? Who can I make the center of the radar and not have it be me? The Bible says that we're free in Jesus to risk our vulnerabilities to serve other people. I was at a pastor's conference and there was a scene that took place. I don't know how we ended up in the front row. It was like two, 250 people, and me and two other clowns were in the front row. And it was like a uh, Chevy Chase um, funny farm episode that it was Christmas season, and they were singing, and it was 250 voices, and it was a smaller room, so it was loud. And there was a break, and there was an to apparently my friend Bob, it was an unexpected break. And he did exactly what Chevy Chase did. He belted out the word joy like it was, a, it was unbelievable. It was so hilarious to us. And we were from like the big church in the, in the region, so now we're the jerks sitting down front laughing through this song. I just can't stop. I'm literally like a little junior high girl laughing that he did that. And then he kept his composure, then he leaned over and he goes, did, um, did I just sing a solo? And now I'm now I'm lost. I am out of control laughing like, yes, you absolutely did. That was the funniest thing I think I've ever heard. And that's how our, we feel like something like that's going to happen. Something, we're too, that's part of salvation is I no longer need to worry about me. I don't need to worry about my reputation. I don't need to worry about what people think of me. He's accepted me just the way I am. Don't, don't change. It's just the way you are. He loves you and accepts you exactly this way. You're fine. No, nah, but I've done some bad. I, I know you have. And the reason I know you have is because you're alive sitting in this room or listening online because everybody has. But that doesn't define who you are. What defines who you are is not the career or accomplishment or that you didn't mess up, which truth is you didn't mess up in a way that people saw it, maybe. We've all failed. We've all struggled. But then in salvation, we become defined by the fact that for some reason, God loves us so much that he gave his one and only son that anyone who believes in him has everlasting life. That's who defines you. That's who you are. That was a great quote, Mart, uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, who said to him, the whole world is against you. And they weren't exaggerating. It was about the whole world. You know what Martin Luther said? then I'm against the whole world. Like, that, that has no bearing on me. I wake up every day and spend my time in the Word, and I say, are we good? And he goes, are you good? I love you so much, I sent my son to die for you. I love sitting alone with, I love being with, so, so we're okay. I said, no, no, we're more than Okay. So that freedom that we have, the text says, don't use that freedom now, that weight that's off, that good, now I can go and manipulate people and I can go do things that I want to do to feed my own flesh and my desires. He specifically said, no, now don't use it as an opportunity for the flesh, but use your freedom, your confidence to serve others.
That's a high priority. We actually use it to serve. Jesus modeled it for us in Mark 10. It's a pretty bold statement. It's Mark 10, 45. He said, for even the Son of Man, he referred to himself often as the Son of Man. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Peter taught it. He said in 1 Peter 4, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Oh, wait a minute. It's going to be unique. As you're gifted, use that gifting to serve people. Oh, now it's discovery time. We serve in different ways. It's literally knowing what you're good at and what you like to do, and that's what's beautiful about God. It's things that you like to do. He's gifted you in a particular way, not so that you can reap from it for your own rewards. You do it actually to serve people. That's what Peter said. Paul said in Ephesians 2, for we are... Ready for this? This is who you are. You are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God actually prepared in advance for you to do. So what's the necessary ability? It's the second point in your notes. What's the necessary ability to be a good servant? What you need as an ability is availability. That's it. It's availability. It's interesting, in the decades past, there's a a movement that doesn't believe that Moses actually existed. I get their reasoning. It's in academic scholarship where they're really believing, we don't think that he really lived. And we all go, what are you talking about? Well, hear the reasoning. They're wrong, but hear the reasoning. Part of it is because he was so outrageously ahead of his day and ahead of his time. He shows up on the scene and actually builds a society off of some laws that are monotheistic, meaning one God. Nobody was one God at the time. They were all plurality. How did this guy actually have the vision way ahead of its time, like no other, to establish a society based on law and ethic and monotheistic and the story on the street, the most humble guy in the entire world? He, like, he had it all. Well, based on all of those things, they say he couldn't have. This had to have been a story to try to talk about some things, but it's a made-up figure, and of course, we disagree with that, and fortunately, conservative theologians don't even play with the subject. I want you to see this one scene of his. It's on a painting, and there were some unusual things about this particular painting of Moses. It was painted in the 1600s. Even though it's a little small, I think you still can see there's a few unique things in the art world that he did here that was never done before. One was he's not overly spiritualized. That was normally the case. He's extremely masculine. That was unusual. It was usually soft features and a glow about him. And he didn't, this, pain, this painter, he was out of nowhere. This painter decides, no, I want to I see what it actually looked like. And it's, he's coming from the sheep, and the burning bush is ahead of him, but he's really looking at neither, which is interesting. I think message-wise, it'd been nice if he'd been looking at the bush leaving the sheep. I don't 
know exactly he's in between. He's taking off his sandals, which maybe you've studied that before. You know some of the significance of that. There's a great humility to it. There's a vulnerability to it. But really, it's the text. He interacts with God with the burning bush. The bush is not burning up. And Moses is heard a voice that says, uh, I need you to do something. To which Moses says, here I am. And then it goes more like us after that. So here I am. What do you want? He goes, well, this is what I'm going to want you to do. I'm going to want you to go to Pharaoh. And if it were like the cool thing to do at the day, God would have said, I want you to go to Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses would have said, eh. <laughs> eh. not going to do that. And he might as well have said that. Because maybe some of you have marked in your Bible this passage in Exodus chapter 3, the five excuses he gives, it's just the funniest thing in the world if it weren't so important. Five times Moses says no with a new reason. Because five times God answers the excuse and we go on to the next one. So it's in Exodus 3, the burning bush is taking place. Three ten, come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But, Moses said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out? Who, who am I to do that? I can't do that. His first big excuse, I'm a nobody. Which for us, we're going, perfect, you're at a good place. That's where we're supposed to start. I can't. Nothing good out of me. It's only God's grace that works through me. But he says, no, I can't do it. And then he does it again in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what's his name? What am I supposed to say? Like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to say. So, I'm a nobody. I don't know what to say to this. Which led to one of the greatest passages in the Old Testament to which God said to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people, I am has sent you. It's not I was, it's not I used to be. He is, he is all existence. It's the name Yahweh. This is his proper name. He actually gave it, and it's this name that is above any type of name, and the name in it itself conveys how amazing he is. He goes, so there. You want a name? I gave you the name. So Moses says, okay, good, I'll go. No, he doesn't. Chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses said, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. What's the next plan? They're not going to listen to me. Now what do I do? He has to answer that one. And then in verse 10, But Moses said to the Lord, Oh my God, I am not eloquent either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. I'm inadequate. And I love the final one, the greatest last excuse in the world to not do something for God is verse 13 of Exodus 4, when Moses said, oh my God, please send someone else. I just love that. It's like, okay, final word. God's like, yeah, bring it on. I've answered everything. I have an idea. Send somebody else. He's called us to service. And you and I don't go to service. Service is where we are. So wherever you go, it's the spirit of service. And your personality fits with it. Some of you, we could tell the funniest joke in the world, and you'll go, yeah, that's funny. 
And that's the most we get out of you. Yeah, that's hilarious. And everyone go, wow, do you see how emotional he just got? It's your, it's your personality. Don't try to be like somebody else. I'm not going to say every time you're in a smart Starbucks line, you've got to befriend everybody and you need to be a servant to everybody around. No, be who you are and discover in who you are how you're going to serve people around you. Bring God into the conversation, though. Don't sit there and just say, boy, what am I good at? What I? No, it's God. I want to serve you. You have set me free specifically to serve one another. What do you want me to do? Reveal it to me. Give me an opportunity. Give me a way in which I can exercise the grace in me to serve people around me. This text in Exodus is one of the greatest in the Old Testament. And the idea is that success is driven by service. It's not what you know. It's not your unique abilities. It's your availability. Are you willing to use those things that God has given you to serve people around you? You wonder if you're qualified. I don't know how we get it out of our mind. I don't, those in positions are somehow higher. They're somehow better. Well, if they're harder to replace, then they must be more valuable than the busy people below that are just serving. I don't, I don't know how to get that out of our mind because we live in a society, in a world that just demands that to be the case. Jesus' ways are upside down from the world. They're not the same. As much as you and I say the first will be last and the last will be first, as much as we say that, that we should be fighting for the bottom rung, we could say that, we could memorize the fact that God honors servanthood and that we're to serve others and that we're just to give ourselves to other people. As much as we say that, the end of the day, we have been so programmed to think that the valuable people are the ones up front. I think God will probably do this for me someday. We've talked about it. He didn't really say a lot. I want in heaven, just like, it won't take long. I want him, if he would, please, line people up in the order of those who loved him the most or something like that. I'll just say, can we just real quick, since, since we have forever, just line them up. Like even a local body to say, hey, can I get the abundant life people over the last, well, t- say over the last 25 years, since we're in the new building, since 2000, I want everyone who considered this their home church, member or not, doesn't matter, but they regular attender, God, could you line them all up and those who just loved you and served you the most all the way to me? I'll I'll say it so I'm not disappointed. I'll just go ahead and put myself at the end. And I just wonder how many of us would see that and go, wow. Why is there not a pastor in the top 20? I I don't know. I wonder after 25 years, I wonder if there'd be some that we'd go, I don't even know who that is. I'm I'm not sure who that is. To which God would say, oh, that's the one who sought my heart more than anybody. They just served and cared, and they spent more time in prayer for people. You don't see it. Oh, I saw it. But then if we write the story of the way the history of the church it's always pastor and officers, because that's how we present the story. 
Oh, this is when God brought us this pastor, and he served for this amount of time, because it's the history, the visible history. But I don't know, and I don't know what's wrong with us saying to God, I, I, I want to be looked at you as one who loves you and serves you no one more than me. I want to be right at the top of that. How do I do it? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to spend time with? I want to spend time with people that I have no personal benefit for having spent time with them. See the difference? We do spend time with people that there is benefit. That's good too. I don't want to show favoritism. But how much time, how much service, how much care, how much love for people that I have nothing to gain from other than the fact that I got to serve them? The last point is opportunities for service are as countless as there are people who serve. The text I gave is Mark 10 because that's where two of the disciples were the brothers were saying, hey, can I sit at your right hand in the kingdom, and can I sit at your left hand? Like, they're literally fighting to be at the top. I love that. And that's where he said, that's that's the text where Jesus then said, no, no, you're missing it. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. So how much more you? There's a story of an elderly widow restricted in her activities, certainly as she was in her earlier years, but was eager to serve Christ. So after praying about this subject, she realized that she could bring blessings to others by playing the piano. You go, okay, I, our mind's like, okay, I, I can see how you could do that. So she placed a small ad in the Oakland Tribune, of which the area in which she lived, and the ad said this, pianists will play hymns by phone daily for those who are sick and despondent. The service is free. When people called, she would say, what hymn do you want me to play or what do you want to hear? Within a few months of her playing had brought cheer to several hundred people. Many of them freely poured out their hearts to her, and she was able to help and encourage them. And we almost want to hear the rest of the story, so who is it? They're pretty famous. Like, what's the kick? Paul Harvey, right? Okay, and? No, there's no and. That was actually the end of the story. It was just a lady who said, I'm bound, I'm, I'm stuck here, but I do a piano and I have a phone. Doing anything she can to serve. And there is no doubt that that exists in this room right now, those types of people. You're phone calling, you're keeping up. Things that nobody sees. Your care for a neighbor. And you look around and go, really, if I wasn't doing it, I don't know if anyone would. And I'm thinking, I think you're probably right. You might be the one. You're giving things, your money or things or something of need, and you're taking care of, you're doing it, but the idea is that it's so quiet we don't see it. So as much as we want to pray to God that maybe he would expand us, it's as much maybe to stop and say, no, you're doing a pretty good job. You're serving. You're using your freedom to care and serve for others. There's a, uh, just a quick quote, I'm not going to do the audio, but the real quick quote by uh, William Booth, William and Catherine Booth, as you may know, any Salvation Army people in the, in the room? Have you guys rung the bell or anything? Okay, none in here, huh? Um, 1865 is when Salvation Army started, and it's William and Catherine, and I should never really ever put a picture just of him because she was as much a leader as he was. Uh, today, Salvation Army is in 133 countries. Uh, there are 15,000 congregations, like churches, with Salvation Army. Towards the end of his life, and was it 1912, towards the end of his life, 
they had discovered he was losing his sight for good. And so he had kind of a large family. A few of them became leaders in the church. And one of them, his son, was given the difficult task of telling his father that there would be no recovery for his sight. Okay, think for a minute if you got those words. The general, General William Booth, said, Do you mean that I'm blind? The son said, I fear we must contemplate that you're never going to see again. He said, I'm never going to see again? (laughs) And they're patiently letting this sink in. No, not in this world. And this is what General Booth said. I have done what I could for God for these wonderful people with my eyes. Now I shall see what God wants me to do for these people without my eyes. Can you believe that? There are more homeless shelters, food for the needy, bills being paid by Salvation Army. It's because of that heart. That's the heart. Wait, that's the first thing he thought of? Oh, I'm not going to be able to see the face of my grandchild. Wouldn't that be the first thing that we think of? I'm not going to be able to continue reading on. I'm not going to be able to. The first thing he says, I've done so much for God, serving him with my eyes. Now I'm going to see what I can do without my eyes. Isn't that a great challenge for us? So whatever it is, it's no fanfare. There's no parade. There's no one cheering. No one rising and saying, you're amazing that you just delivered that meal. Wow. There's none of that. But it's literally walking in the footsteps of Jesus himself who said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. And our challenge, of course, to serve one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this passage. And we're open. I think that's maybe where we're, we are right now. We're open. We're open for you to reveal to us individually what it is that you would like us to do and how to best serve you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.